really excited to be here today uh, sitting with Andy Ricker who is a known Thai food expert. He is <laughs> a big part of actually pushing our American consciousness around Thai food and understanding of it beyond Pad Thai, green curry, the things you see in so many restaurants uh, here in America. Um, he has Pock Pocs in Portland and New York, New York yeah. restaurants. He has won a James Beard Award, which is hard to get, so Two. I'm here. Two? <laughs> Two. You know, it would be accurate. Yeah. In which years? Uh, well, I won for Best Chef one year, and I won for Writing in another year. Oh, nice. Article, yeah. I didn't know about the writing one. Wow. Yeah. So many talents. <laughs> um, and you've published your second cookbook this year, which is why yes. we're all here today. It's called The Drinking Food of Thailand. Um, before we dive into that, I wanted to ask you guys in the audience quickly, how many of you have been to Thailand? Nice. Wow, a bunch of you. That's great. <laughs> And then how many have been to a Pock Pock? The Very same cool. people. Yeah. <laughs> not, except for you, okay. Not super surprising. Um, well, great. So there's some people that aren't fully acquainted maybe with your restaurants. So I sure. thought it might be good for you to dive into um, your expertise and kind of how you got here. You don't look like you're Thai. Nope. Am I right? That's okay. true. You're very right about that. <laughs> so how did we get here? How are... How, how did... So the question, how did I... Like start your a journey, Thai restaurant? Like how did your I journey get to, to becoming a Thai food yeah. expert, basically. Um, well, first of all, I, I want to say that I, I don't consider myself an expert. Um, okay. I consider myself more of a student. Um, and how I got here was by traveling. I mean, essentially, that's, that's the way, that's the, in my opinion, that's the best way to learn. If you're curious about something that is a living culture or living uh, art form or cuisine or something that comes from somewhere else, you go there and check it out. Um, I went there initially as a backpacker in the 80s, and I wasn't really looking for anything except for a good time, right. uh, which I had. <laughs> and uh, I went again in the early 90s, and 92 to be exact, and I had a really good friend of mine who was living there who had uh, married a local woman who worked at the uh, university as a professor, uh, and they were, she was from Chiang Mai, and that's where he had settled in. So. They introduced me to, to the local cuisine while I was there, uh, which was, um, you know, the it was very. Se they introduced me to some seasonal dishes. Right. I, I didn't really realize that there was such a thing as seasonal food. Yeah. When it comes to Thai food, because my experience was much like a lot of other folks in America, which is that you get your experience by going to a Thai restaurant here, and for many many years, things are changing a lot now. Over the last ten years, things have changed a lot, but. You know, during that time, you know, it was basically the same menu wherever you went, and it never changed. So, uh, you know, being in Chiang Mai and being introduced to a dish that was like local, seasonal, regional, uh, was really kind of shocking. What was that dish? Do you remember? Yeah, I, I remember. I, I mean, I've told this story probably a million times, but uh, um, it's a dish called Gang Het Top. Het Top is a type of mushroom. It looks like a puffball. It's kind of really dark brown, kind of. It has kind of a bitter taste to it, very earthy and bitter. But it's a really prized wild mushroom. Mm -hmm. So right around March, April, they start coming up in the forest and people, I, I, I live in Chiang Mai, I live in a small village about 20 kilometers north of Chiang Mai. And during het top season, if you try to go to the market in the village, uh, as soon as the head tops start popping up around, like all of a sudden all the shops are closed. And you're like, where, oh. where is everybody? Why? And they're like, oh, they're off gathering head top because head top gets 200 baht a kilo you know, oh, or more. Cool. So, uh, and, and they're, you know, you can go get them for free out of the forest. Right. So, so they're very, really highly prized, but they only come up, you know, for about a month, month and a half out of the year. And when they come up, they start, they make some dishes using that, that particular mushroom. Amazing. Yeah. And so that was, that was the way that I, I kind of first connected with the idea that there was something regional, local, seasonal. Um, and, Ephemeral. And, yeah, like just like uh, regional American food or Spanish food or Italian food or French food or anywhere where there's, there's a regional, seasonal type uh, cuisine. And from there, you just kind of got hooked, and then you kept yeah. going mm -hmm. back to Thailand and just became a real true student of the food, it sounds like. Yeah, I, I started going back again and again and again. and um, it. it 
you know, at first it was very tentative because I couldn't speak the language. I uh, couldn't read, still can't read the language. Um, and I didn't really know that much about it. So I was relying on uh, my friends to, to kind of guide me and uh, friends of friends. I was just spending all my time in markets walking around looking at stuff, slowly learning how to speak the language until I started to gain enough knowledge that I could kind of start really delving into it. Cool. And at the, that time, what were you doing for work? Were you a cook? Were you... Okay. So I was initially, I was uh, working as a cook or a sous chef or whatever. Okay. In Portland? Um, or? Yeah, in Portland. Um, yeah, it was mostly Portland at this point. Um, and then uh, I started being a painting contractor. I was a painting contractor for about eight years. And what, what that allowed me to do was, you know, I'd work really hard from the spring through the end of summer into the holiday season. And then work would dry up over the holiday season, which was perfect, so I could go to Thailand and hang out for a couple of months. And awesome. so that happened every year. And that was where I really started digging in during, you know, sort of the mid-90s up to the early 2000s. So let's talk about the book. Um, the title is interesting, mm -hmm. The Drinking Food of Thailand, yes. not Thai drinking food. You know what? So I actually had a bit. Of, I had a little bit of a battle with the uh, the editor over that. Tell us about it. Okay, so the t <laughs> <laughs> tell us about so, the fight. <laughs> it wasn't. It wasn't a major fight. Like the first, we had a huge fight about the, the photograph on the first book. This was a, so the, the title of it is Ahan Gapram, which means with food with whiskey. Ahan Gapram, and the drinking food of Thailand is instead of Thai drinking food. When you say when when I think of Thai food or Thai. Uh, I'm thinking of the center of Thailand. I'm okay. thinking of um, I'm thinking of the Thai people, and they they're uh, the dominant culture. But they're not the only culture there. There's the, the people of the north, the Khon Mung, uh, and then there's like subgroups of, of ethnic groups, Yong, uh, Mon, that type of thing. That that if you look back far enough in history, you see that the Thai people are the most dominant culture now. But they weren't always right. And the language of the north is different from the language of the center, is different from the language of the northeast, which is where mostly uh, Lao and Khmer people live. Uh, the, the, the climates are very different. Staple rices are different. The very south of Thailand has its own culture, language, and, and food. And so when you, when you say Thai food to a Thai person, uh, say we're in Chiang Mai and you say to your friend, you want to go out and eat? And they say, what do you want to eat? If you say Thai food, you're talking about central Thai food. You're okay. going to go eat, or you want to eat uh, Isan food, you're going to go find a, a northeastern restaurant, restaurant. Or if you want to eat Thai Yai food, you're going to go eat Shan Thai Yai food. It's not Thai food. Right. So I know it seems petty, <laughs> but no, I kind of went to the mat normal. with them because I wanted to say Thai drinking food. I'm like, no, it's really it's not because we're, we're going kind of around the country a little bit and cherry picking things. And some of the food that's that's featured in here has nothing to do with Thai, central Thai food at all. So that okay. was important to me to make that distinction. And I, in, in a lot of ways, that's kind of what I've um, attempted to do with the restaurants and the books since the beginning, is kind of point out that, it's, that, that Thailand isn't a monoculture. Though, if you ask somebody from Thailand who's from Isan, they still feel Thai. Right. right? But there's a back there's a back history to everything. It's it's not apparent. Got it. That helps to define the food, and it, hel it helps people to understand uh, the food itself and how to eat it and how it fits into the context of the culture. So I'm guessing that you can't get any of this food in any of your restaurants. But no, you is can. Wrong? Okay. You can absolutely. We have a restaurant in Portland called the Whiskey Soda Lounge, oh, which right. is okay. dedicated to this food. By you know, actually, okay. yeah. Amazing. Yeah. So if people are just picking up this book for the first time, which I'm guessing a lot of people in the audience here will be doing, um, is there like an, a good icebreaker recipe in the book? Like yeah. a nice starting place? There is. There's probably one of my favorite dishes in the genre, something called Yam, yam Met Mamuang Himapan, which is long. What page? Uh, it should be pretty early on. Okay. <laughs> it's in the salads. But essentially, it's a very it. long way of saying cashew nut salad. So really, oh, really, I it's like it's very, very simple. You just roast cashew yeah. nuts either dry or in oil. And then you just sprinkle salt, uh, scallions, and chilies on top of it. Um, and then you just eat it with a spoon. And, that looks and easy. They're, 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 it's about as easy as it this gets. This is a recipe? It's a recipe, believe okay. it or not. 
Um, and that picture, you see the picture that's taken. I should talk a little bit, like uh, show, like the, the show them the picture, yeah. So that was taken at a karaoke uh, in, I'm trying to remember where we were when we took this. I think we were in Ang Tong, north of, of, uh, north of, uh, of Bangkok when we took that. At a hotel, they had like a, a karaoke slash sort of stage show uh, place, cabaret. And um, it's the table number 35 there, in case yes, you didn't notice. Yes, I see that. <laughs> um, so cool. So these are pictures yeah, but so directly what we from did, travels. So what we did was we went around and we took photographs of the food. There's the karaoke bar. And that, that's a different place. That's, oh, okay. that's in Bangkok at, a, at a, an Isan-style cabaret. Um, we went to these various different types of drinking establishments. And we shot the dishes there. They'd bring it, put it on the table, and bam, we'd shoot it with a hard flash. Kind of like to make it, you know, so the, the vibe should feel kind of like you're out somewhere at night. But that, that's, that dish itself is something that you can find almost anywhere where you're going to go out and uh, go drinking. Side of the road, anywhere where they can cook stuff. It's such an easy thing to do, and people love it so much. That, yeah. that it's, it, and it's kind of, if you think about it, it's kind of perfect drinking food. It's hot. Uh, it's, it's like nutty and salty, crunchy, uh, and it goes great with beer or whiskey. So like a really good thing to just throw together if you're yeah. having people over and you want to have a You're watching the football game starter. or whatever. Yeah. yeah. It's, it looks really dopey, simple, almost lazy, but it's, pro it's one of the most delicious things in the book. Very cool. Really, really good, yeah. How about something that is like more labor intensive, maybe a little more daunting, but mm -hmm. you just think it's so amazing, you're so proud of it, and it's worth the effort for people to maybe spend yeah. a whole day finding the ingredients and cooking it. So one of, the, one of the premises of the book was, first of all, was to go out and shoot it and, and then do the recipes later. The other one was to, to uh, have a, a little bit of discovery during the process of making the book, um, like trying to find a new dish or some interesting way of cooking that I hadn't had before in the process of making the book. So there's this one dish called uh, Sikrong Mu Tainam, which means pork ribs cooked underwater, uh, and, and it's a, it's kind of a punny thing. It, it, it essentially the the trick is that you 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 kind of uh, you pound up a, a paste of aromatics and chilies and garlic and stuff like that, and then you, um, you you mix it either with chicken wings or with pork ribs, and you put it into a pot with maybe just a little bit of oil, but not much, and then uh, fire it up, and you put a bowl of ice water on top of it. Hmm. And the ice water seals the top of the pot. And as the moisture from the, the cooking paste and meat and everything hits the bottom of the bowl, it condenses and drops back down into the pot. Um, now, how did I find this? In the weirdest place. So I was in Slovenia. <laughs> Not Thailand. Not Thailand. <laughs> but I was traveling with a good friend of mine, this guy named David Thompson, who's a really well-known Thai chef. Uh, also, obviously not Thai. Uh, and his sous chef, um, Pat, said, hey, have you ever heard of this dish, um, you know, Thai Nam? And I was like, no, I never heard of that before. Yeah. And he explained it to me. So when I got to Thailand, I started looking into it, and I asked a few people around. It turns out it's kind of an Isan thing, a northeastern thing. And um, I didn't have a recipe. So I just kind of looked around on the internet to see if there was anybody who was making it. <laughs> I couldn't find anybody in, port in, in Chiang Mai area that actually made it. It's kind of, I think it's more kind of like something that people do at home. Okay. So I talked yeah. to some friends from Isan. They're like, oh, yeah, yeah, that's, it's this whole thing. And so, I, I, you know, uh, it was described. Like, they described the various different things you would put into it. So I just kind of tried it, you know. And it took me probably about six or eight times to get it right. But um, it's a really interesting technique. It's a delicious dish. It, it kind of smothers the, the meat in this paste and kind of sticks to the ribs. And mm. it's really, really spicy, really uh, savory. And it's, it's if you want to impress somebody with your cooking skills, it's a good one. That's really cool. <laughs> that story is so interesting, too. Yeah. So you never actually found someone cooking know, it in their I home never found or it. something. No, I didn't. Um, but, huh. but you know what exists, I that know, people I, are making it. Yeah. And, and I talked to some people, some Isan people about it. And they're like, oh, yeah, we used to do that with a whole chicken. Some people would like, they'd take a whole chicken and chop it up and do it. Or some people would say, we just do it with wings. But I thought it would be really good with pork because it would allow it to cook for a longer period of time. Mm. Um, so anyway. Smart. Yeah. Wow. It's very cool. That's, that's the chef-y bit of me coming out. Like, I normally don't exercise. Well, you are that, a but. chef, so <laughs> we expect that. That's what they tell me. Um, 
so I know there's a lot of maybe hard to find ingredients in this book. I would love for you to talk about some of those. Maybe here, no. I think you guys are, are tight here. I, that, like, in San Francisco. Yeah, there's very few things that that are in this book that you can't get in a in a good Southeast Asian market in, in San Francisco. This particular book. Cool. There's a few things like occasionally, um, like for one of the recipes for lab, there's a few spices that are really difficult to get a hold of that um, you have to really hunt it down. I found them in New York through a, a, a purveyor there. And I bet if there's anybody from Chiang Mai that lives here or Northern Thailand, you'd probably be able to find a few of these things. So okay. there's one called Mahuen, which is kind of a black prickly ash, relative of prickly ash. It's relatively hard to find. There's no real substitute for. What does that taste like? Uh, kind of like black prickly ash. Oh, delicious. <laughs> I was thinking of just like a the um, numbing, it's spicy peppercorn. It's peppery, but it Chinese doesn't have food. that numbing, that really numbing okay. flavor that the Szechuan peppercorns have. Um, and it's got kind of, it's kind of got a bitter, kind of like very distinctive flavor um, that is not entirely unlike Szechuan peppercorn, mm. but also not quite like it either. I think that that particular t type of, of tree, I think there's a lot of different varieties, a bunch of different varieties. Green, there's green red, black, and then a whole bunch of other stuff. Uh, the trees are amazing. They're, they're, the trees for the, for the session, I don't know if you've ever seen them before, but the, the trunks have like these crazy spikes on them. So whoever decided to climb one to get the, get the stuff out of there the first time was a real daredevil. A real hero of yeah. cooking. Yeah. They might not have lived to tell the tale. <laughs> yeah. Are there things that you have to order online? Like certain things that you... Mm. I, again, I, I really I think if you if you look around here, uh, you're you're going to find everything you need. Uh, perhaps if you live in Kansas City, you might have to order stuff online or right. use frozen things. But here, I think you're you're pretty good. Yeah. Awesome. Um, so, how about if if people are going to get this book for someone for Christmas or mm. as a gift, is there some kind of a companion gift you think might be good with it? Like. Yeah, a Some bottle cool of whiskey or six-pack of beer, I think, is probably the best companion for that it. That would be the most um, festive, for sure. And you probably want to get it for somebody who likes to drink. Yes. Um, actually, I'm interested to know. Mortar and pestle. Actually. A mortar and pestle? Yeah. I mean, really, like, it's really difficult to make this food without a mortar and pestle. Okay. I don't really know how to do it without it. So um, what you want is a, a granite mortar and pestle. You should have one of those anyway if you're into cooking. So how, where do you find one of those? Do they you have it at William Southie. Sonoma? or? Uh, they might have like a little crappy one. At, right, you know, you I go, know because you, you said go, granite, so I'm yeah. like. You want to go? You want to go to a Southeast Asian market, and they typically have them. But they range right. in size from sort of this to this. You know, but right. typically you can find some that are, that are about that big, and try to get the biggest one you can find because it's not going to be that big, and it, it, you can make curry pastes in it. And, and does almost stuff. every recipe require that tool? Almost or? every, not okay. not all. The yam at Mamuang Himipan doesn't. Okay. <laughs> Noted. Yep. So that's in, that's just kind of like a part of the um, the pomp and not the pomp and circumstance, but the preparation of most Thai dishes is that people whip out their mortar and pestle and they're mm -hmm. just well, smashing me, together flavors. I can to, give you a story about that too. So the store, the the name of the restaurant, Bok Bok, is the sound of a pestle hitting a mortar. Okay. So um, the way that I came up with that name was. <laughs> Many years ago, I was on uh, the deal, uh, diesel rail car from Korat back to Bangkok, and I had come from, I'd come from all the way up in Chiang Mai, and I'd come all the way down through Isan and ended up in Korat or, or uh, Uban Ratchatani, and I went there to eat uh, lab duck lab, and I, you know, I, I was on the rail car back to Bangkok, and I was sitting in third class because I was a broke ass backpacker. And um, there were some folks there who were, who were workers from Isan who were going back to Bangkok after the holidays. And we started talking. And they said, why are you here? Why did you come to Korat? Because at the time, there were very few. There were some expats there, but not many tourists. And um, even though it's one of the biggest metropolitan areas in all of Thailand, it's mm. huge, it's like second or third largest in all of Thailand by, by uh, size. Um, and I said, well, I want to, to, to eat the food. And I named a few of the dishes. And they're like, oh, well, you like to eat that. Do you, can you cook, too? And I was like, I, I can, yeah, I can cook some things. And, and I said, I, can you cook? And he said, yeah, bok, 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 bok. 
making the, you know, the motion of, of the, the pestle hitting You're the mortar. Like, all right, I got it. And yeah, but it, it, and it was. It was very much an aha moment because in, in his mind, oh, yeah, he connected the idea of cooking with a mortar and pestle. That was his, his immediate, he didn't kind of go like, like right. that or, he, <laughs> yeah. he was like, pock, pock. He, it was mortar and pestle right away. So it, it is like literally there, there is no way to cook Thai food without a mortar and pestle that I know of that, that is going to give you kind of results that, that are anywhere near what right. I think they should be. Uh, you can use a, some people use blenders or food processors or stuff, but like there's Vitamix. something about it that's not quite right. right. Um, as far as drinking goes, um, I noticed, I was skimming through the book, I noticed you talk about a lot of things that you can't get here, like some kind of Thai beer that I've never heard mm -hmm. of, rice whiskey. Mm -hmm. um, what do you recommend that people drink with this food here in San Francisco? I'm guessing it's not going to be a Sonoma Cabernet or something like that. Well, you can do, you can drink whatever you want. Wine's actually started to become quite popular in Thailand with the upper middle class. It's kind of a luxury item and kind of a big face thing to do mm. is buy wine. There's actually a couple of wineries in Thailand now. Uh, they're not good, but that's, you know, <laughs> it's to be expected. It's not quite grape growing country. Right. Um, so beer is probably the thing that you're going to, you're going to have the easiest time drinking. That makes sense. Uh, and, and eating with this, uh, using as the, the, the main Foil. booze. Yeah. Um, but Thailand is a rice, uh, a rice liquor country historically. Uh, beer started out as a luxury item there, and for, uh, for a lot of folks, I'd say the vast majority of the, of the poorer folks who live in the countryside, it's still a luxury item. Mm. So it was introduced to Thailand back probably 60 or 70 years ago, maybe a little longer, but it was imported from like Germany or uh, Holland or something like that. Which, and, which brands? Back then, I couldn't tell you. Okay. I, I don't know. Because now but it's mostly the Chong and the Singha, right? So, so and, and there's, there's a story there. It's actually in the book. Um, I know this guy named Nick Birimbakti, and he's the, the grandson of the founder of Singh. And the Singh family is, uh, the, the Birimbakti family is a very high so family in, in mm. Thailand. They're very, very rich. They own Singh. They're connected to the royal family, all that kind of stuff. Um, and uh, Nick's grandfather uh, used to own a ferry company that went across the Chao Phraya River from uh, Bangkok to Bangkok Noi. And um, he started seeing the motor cars coming into play and then bridges being built across the river. And he could see that his business was probably not going to be as strong in the future. Mm. So he started looking for ways to diversify. And he had studied in Germany. Uh, and his brother was in, in Germany as well studying. He'd come back as an engineer. Sent his brother back to Germany to learn how to be a brewmaster. So his brother went back, learned how to be a brewmaster, came back, and they started brewing beer, uh, you know, for, for which there was almost no market. So he spent, I think, you know, the first few years that they were open, several years, they brewed like four or five different brands of beer. And he went and he'd, you know, he'd go to towns and he'd put on a movie night and give people beer to taste. And uh, out of like the five or six different formulas they had, the one that stuck was the Sing, which is like a, a kind of a tiger-like. A little bit sweet. It, uh, well, the the Sing is is a, is a mythological creature, and it kind of tigery. So, but right? the but the beer itself, yeah, kind of. It looks the like The beer one. itself was <laughs> kind of like. Uh, Whatever, it was the one that people liked. Right. So that's what they stuck with, and they got rid of all the other crap, right? <laughs> Smart. Uh, <laughs> it's not rocket science. And then, and then they, they did a, a couple of really sneaky moves, which was to kind of petition the crown to, to uh, kind of make it difficult for other people to compete with them. Hmm. So that's why there's only a couple of beers left. There's some really arcane laws there um, where uh, it's basically the, the, it's, co it's counter to what you would think it would be. You can only commercially produce beer if you produce a huge amount at a time okay. and, and sell a huge amount at a time. So if you produce less than that amount, you can't sell it publicly. You can sell it in your own establishment, but you can't sell it commercially, uh, which has been really problematic for the people who are into craft beer in Thailand because they can either import stuff at great expense or they can only they can make it, but they can't really sell it outside of their own little pub. Hmm. Uh, so they've had they've had a kind of a lock on on the beer 
uh, industry there for decades, decades and decades. Uh, slowly starting to change now. But even then, beer was a luxury. So, and, and today, if you're, um, say you're working on a, a rice farm or you're working in a factory, your, your median wage there is probably around, it, it got up, to, I think they, they'd pumped it up to like closer to 500 baht a day and then they just cut the minimum wage huh. recently back down to like 310 baht a day or 270 baht a day. So it's possible that- Is that because the, that president died, right? It's because the military took over and the, the kind of the, it's, it's a long, I don't want okay, to get into the politics of it, but it's, the it's uh, uh, there, was, there was some populist shit that was going on for a long time that kind of got axed and um, huh. uh, that was one of the things that was very populist. Um, the, uh, the upshot of it is that, that if you're a worker and you're, and you're making 300 baht a day, which is roughly nine bucks a day, okay. and you go to 7-Eleven and you buy a beer, it might cost you 100 baht for a big bottle of beer, 90 wow. to, 95 to 100 baht for a large bottle of beer. Uh, but you can also go down to the local Laokao stand and you can buy a whole bottle of rice whiskey for 80 baht. That's what I was reading about in the book. So, yes. right, you can, you know, one bottle of beer gets nobody fucked up and <laughs> one bottle of whiskey gets four people fucked up. So yes. it's, a, it's a matter of economics. Plus they've been, you know, it's a rice culture going back hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. Um, and, you know, so people are used to drinking that. So that was, a lot of this, these things were kind of made with that in mind. Now, if you want to try to replicate that here, go and buy the cheapest, crappiest shochu you can find. <laughs> or sochu. Uh, and that, that approximates what kind of a crappy lao kao or white whiskey will be like. Okay. Same thing, it's, it's a distilled from rice typically, unless it's distilled from barley or, you know, just look for a rice-based shochu that's not too expensive and you, you can get an idea of what lao kao tastes like. Sounds delicious. Yeah, it's fantastic. <laughs> so when I was in Thailand, um, I remember people telling me that the beer was unregulated and that there was amphetamines in some of the chong. That's, that's a total. That's a total lie. Okay, I just had to ask. <laughs> I know that's off topic, but I was. Just I curious. think. I think what what they're talking about is that, that there was there's rumors out there that I, I'm not sure whether this, they're true or not that the alcohol content isn't regulated from batch to batch. Um, yes, so, I remember hearing that too. So that, that um, sometimes you get the beer and it's stronger than others. I don't know that that's true anymore. I think that, okay. that mo the beer making in Thailand is very modernized and there's, oh. there's lots of controls and stuff like that. I doubt that's true anymore. But Chang, the, the thing is that when Chang came out and started competing with Singh, they did two things. They made it cheaper and they made it stronger. Okay. That was their, so and they made it sweeter. And that, was, that was why Chang got really, really popular. And Singh battled that by uh, producing Leo beer, which also is a little stronger, cheaper, but not as sweet, a little lighter. All right, so it's diversifying so, a little bit. Yeah, and that happened a while back. All right. Um, so I'm kind of also curious, this doesn't have to do with the book, but I'm wondering, uh, as a traveler, how you avoid tourist traps. I'm sure you're pretty good at that. <sighs> um, How do you make sure you get the food that people in the country are eating and not the crappy, diluted version of that? Well, what I think, I think it's important to not think about it so much as, like, if I go off the beaten track, I'm going to find right. the true stuff. Because unless you read Thai and you know what you're looking for, like you actually know what to look for, like you know the names of the dish, you know where you're going to find it, you know what, what the good one is going to be, you can read Thai, or you're with somebody who can read Thai that trusts you're going to be able to eat the food. You're going to have a very difficult time finding anything at all. Um, and likewise, if you're in the middle of a tourist trap, there's always some good food there because the people who work in the tourist traps eat too. So if you go to, say, MBK, Mabun, Mabun Krong is the, the most famous mall, even though it's kind of the oldest and crappiest one now. Um, and where uh, is that? It's in it's near uh, si uh, Siam Square in the center of Bangkok. Okay. Um, and you go to you go inside. And there's all these food courts there, and some are quite flashy. And there's you know the place where all the tourists go. But there's also a food court on the fifth floor in the back corner that's run by Isan folks. That's actually really bang on like hardcore country style Isan food right in the mall. And that's where all the people that work there go to eat. So you don't have to be in, you don't have to go off the beaten path to find good food. You just have to be willing to dig in and see what's there. And the best advice I can give is go to where the people who are working near where, where 
like you can go to the airport, go to, to uh, Su um, Suwannapum Airport. Mm -hmm. You go down to the bottom level where the taxi cabs are and you go all the way to the end and there's a cafeteria in there. There's a food court. That's where all the people that work in the airport go for lunch. And it's actually really good. Same story at Dan Mung. There's, an, there's a place there that, that all the workers go that's really good. Um, so you can be on, you could be on Pat Pong Road and or you could go or, or go to Kaosan or something, you're still going to find good food. You just have to look for it a little bit. Does that make sense? Yeah. I mean, yeah. you just have to kind of watch where, you have to pay yeah. attention. You have to have your eyes open yeah. and watch where people that live there are going, basically. Now, now the good thing is that nowadays the, there's such a thing as the internet. <laughs> so you can go on the internet and go, best food in this area. And there's yeah. going to be some English-speaking local or English-speaking expat that lives in the area who's mapped all these places. And you're, you can find them because there'll be pictures of the damn place, there'll be a, a pin dropped on it, and you Do you feel that. like it's getting harder, though, as Thailand gets more touristy? Like, I know that tourism has really exploded there in the past um, eight years, probably. I, I don't know that tourism is at fault with the changing food culture there. I think it's mostly having to do with uh, globalization. M yeah, globalization, modernization, the, the existence of a, of a, uh, a middle class. Sp sp speaking about urban areas, right? Um, the you know there's the tastes of the Thai people are changing, but you can still find uh, things made as they were decades ago. Still can. You That's just got to look a little bit hard. The the question of authenticity is one that I know comes up a lot. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like it makes sense to talk about that. Sure, um, it's definitely been in the media a lot lately. People, you know, debating the authenticity of certain foods, mm -hmm. and I'm sure that you get asked <coughs> this question a lot. But how do you how do you deal with you know naysayers or people that challenge the authenticity of your cuisine? Maybe well, that's easy. Not. We don't claim any authenticity to start with. Um, that helps. Uh, part of you know when we. When Pak Pak opened, I banished the word authentic and traditional from the vocabulary uh, because there's such loaded words that mean different things to different people. Um, the absurdity of authenticity. Uh, you talk to any chef, anybody who's a cook, and, you, and uh, who has any knowledge of, of you know, food ways and that kind of thing, and, and that the, the notion of authenticity just kind of goes out the window. Uh, Authentic is what you experience as authentic. So if your mom makes, uh, uh, say, tom kha gai one way, to you that's the authentic way because that's what you grew up taste, eating, tasting, and you've been told by everybody in your family that that's the best version. Right. right? Meanwhile, the dude up the street their mom made it too, and he's been told the same thing. As far as he's concerned, his version is authentic. So no matter if, if you were, if I was to come along and go, here's authentic whatever, people would say, that's not authentic because I know what authentic is because my mom's Thai and she made it this way. And you're like, well, I, you know, I don't know. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that's why we don't use the word authentic. Right. But do you think there's something likewise. to be said for the way in which you approach a cuisine that is not your own? Like I think that has, doesn't have anything to do with authenticity. I think that that has to do with um, with something else. And it, for me, often, yeah, I, I think authenticity is is like a kind of a different subject from that. Um, the the way that you approach cuisine, if you really want to learn about it, you just learn as much as you can, and you don't assume that you know anything. You don't assume that, that you've learned the gold standard. You don't yeah. assume that, that uh, the way that you're doing it is the right way. Right? What are you tr still trying to learn about Thai food? Everything. I mean, I, the are more I know... Are there certain regions you want to... Like <laughs> yeah, the south. is the, the south of Thailand is this giant mystery to me. I've, I've spent some time there. I have the basic idea of what it's about. I've spent some... I probably have maybe a little bit more experience there than most people, but by far I feel like it's, it's a whole mysterious new cuisine that I, that I could spend a, a lifetime learning. Do you plan on it? Um, or are you more I, interested in the regions you're already specializing no, I in? Plan, I plan on spending more time there. I was just there um, shooting some video with the Thai Tourism Authority and we just ate some amazing food. And uh, you know, it's a totally different flavor palette than the North, uh, different ingredients and um, different traditions that it comes from, different way people think about the food, the way that they eat is different. Um, and I, you know, I look forward to learning as much as I can. I mean, I've got, hopefully I'll live long enough that I can delve a little bit into that. Yeah. And you know, yeah. 
So what are, you, what are your goals right now professionally? Like, do you want to basically just retire in Thailand as quickly as possible? I'm or? just trying to keep my head low right now. <laughs> it's, uh, it's kind of a jungle out there yeah. in the restaurant industry. And, um, Explain that. In what ways? Oh, we're going to have to start all over again and be here for hours. Um, <laughs> are you talking about just the physical opening of a restaurant? No, I can open restaurants all day long. I, yeah. I can find a restaurant, design it, do the menu, get it open, no problem. It's the managing of them once mm. you've got it open that's problematic. Uh, we've, got a, we've got a huge problem in the industry with, um, with wage income disparity between the front and back of the house, with the front of the house taking the lion's share of the money, back of the house uh, trailing behind. Meanwhile, restaurants work on a very, very thin margin, very thin. And there's no way in our current system of tipping to reconcile those two things right. without a, cha a sea change in the way that uh, the dining public looks at restaurants. Uh, and it's an extremely difficult problem, and nobody knows what the answer is. Yeah. You know, p the more people try, like people like Danny Meyer, who's an industry leader, tries to change things, he starts getting sued by people for trying to do the right, right thing. So it's, it's, it's a very, very fraught, and there's a lot of emotion around it. There's not a whole lot of facts being used to, to, to kind of... Uh, Disseminate information to the public, yeah, right? Yeah, it's a very difficult thing to educate the public yeah. on. There's a bunch of, of things that people think are true that aren't true that are, it's very difficult to talk about because they're political. Right. Uh, so, it, yeah, it's just not a great, like if you, any of you are thinking of opening a restaurant, don't do it. Yeah. <laughs> don't, do it don't do it right now, wait. <laughs> I know, but it might never yeah. get better. I don't know um, professionally, I, I, think, I think like me, like most people I know that in the industry, we're all just kind of looking at what we do well mm -hmm. and work what, with what we have and try to, to kind of like hone in on that and really maximize whatever we can out of what we already do. Right. Yeah, most people. So you're not going to be opening a lot more pop box, probably. No, I mean we got a we got a quick service um, kind of version of pop pop that that we're, that we're trying to do because we think we can keep it very simple, relatively low cost, and we can pay everybody in the place the same amount, uh, which is higher than average. Yeah, that's so the way to go these days. That's, that's why trying. you're seeing so much fast casual everywhere. Yeah. Because it's yeah. sustainable. Yeah. Well, in theory. No. More sustainable. People keep on cry, trying to crack the soul code. Soul crushing. It's, <laughs> yeah. It's, it's proven to be difficult. So. Right. Yeah. So what else do you want to talk about? I don't know. Maybe we can ask the people if, if there's something they want to talk about. Do you guys have questions? Yes. Uh, so my first job ever, well, first like paycheck job was as a fishmonger. So I always love going to fish markets when I travel. Mm -hmm. um, and I went to Thailand this February, went to Bangkok to the big Autocon. market. Yeah, it yeah. was amazing. Mm -hmm. Do you have any other recommendations within Thailand of like really cool markets, markets? to visit? Yeah. yeah, I mean, every, every major city uh, has some kind of large market. Um, <coughs> the, in Bangkok, when you go back, go to Klong Toy. That's a real education. That's a real kind of crazy. Uh, that's kind of the biggest market in Autocon. It's kind of like this cleaned up, nice place with organic food. And, Sorry, you know. I think I went to Klong Oh, you went to Klang Toy. Okay, Klang Toy is is like really down and dirty. You're wading through, yeah. effl you know, fluent on the floors awesome. and stuff. It's pretty crazy, um, but it's also full of all kinds of weird, weird shit. To be honest with you, there's you know, there's lots of formaldehyde being sprayed, or whatever they call that stuff, for, formalin getting sprayed on vegetables and meat and oh. stuff. So it's kind of it's a little bit hectic. Uh, if you go up to Chiang Mai, oh, so go to Otaka then next time you go. It's that's a very it's an amazing market. It really is. It's beautiful. It's, there's lots of really good prepared foods there. It's or, there's a lot of organic food, like uh, sustainably caught seafood, all this kind of stuff. It's a really great mm -hmm. market. Um, if you go up to Chiang Mai, there's a couple places you can visit. One's called Talat Mung Mai, and that's kind of new market, uh, new city market is called. It's a big central market, kind of like the Klang Tui of, of Chiang Mai, except for not hectic. Um, it's very busy, but not hectic. And that, that's really cool, because you can see a lot of the very, very local stuff. Uh, and anytime you go to any new part of Thailand, you want to go to the, to the morning market, because you get to see what the local people are buying and eating. And you'll see the same thing over and over again. But you'll also see some very local stuff as well. So you know, it's just, uh, I believe there's a couple of people that are working on a, a whole book on it right now. The, the folks from Eating Asia, I think, are working on a book on markets. Um, you were talking about the uh, the seasonal mushroom in Thailand, mm -hmm. and you were talking about uh, they only available for one month. 
Uh, which month is that? It's typically March, April time. Okay, March. Yeah, April it's time. it's in the hot season right and, uh, now. Is that like a like a specific instruction to like pick them like before raining, after raining? Um, I've never gone out and found them in the wild, but typically it's during the dry season. So it's it's be it's right. April is typically very hot, right? And the, it rains sporadically, so it's probably right after it rains a little bit, be my guess. Okay. Um, but they're, they're kind of like a puff ball. They're round and really dark. Yeah. Hmm. yeah. I think they taste better when they're inside the, the casing. Yeah, yeah. The yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, what are your thoughts on uh, Thailand trying to close down the street vendor, street markets? It's a great question. So I don't know if, if you guys are familiar, but Sometime in the in the last year, somebody from the government announced that they were going to shut down all the street vendors in in uh, in Bangkok, and uh, right after they got named best street food city in the world, <laughs> and so it was it was kind of a PR nightmare. And they, the, the the cultural minister popped up and said, No, 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 we're not doing that. We're we're just clearing up some places, and we're gonna we're gonna kind of make it so that you have to get a permit, and we're going to regulate it. We're not going to ban it. We're not going to ban it. We're going to regulate it. But I think actually the guy who piped up actually was telling the hidden truth is that there, there, there is and always has been this sort of like cadre of elite folks in Bangkok who feel that it should be more like Singapore. They mm -hmm. don't like the dirtiness of it. Uh, to be fair, um, a lot of the, the food that you find on the street in Thailand, in, in Bangkok especially these days, it, there's problems. Like first of all, they clog the sidewalk, so you can't walk. It's a difficult city to walk in already. But they, and, and they clog the business area, so you can't. It's very difficult if you're trying to do business there. Uh, also, a lot of the food that they're selling is crap. It's just not good. Um, the bummer of it is, though, that this is this is work for people who are, you know. Migrant, like they're coming from the country, and they, they or they're they're very poor, and they, they this is a way for them to make money, and they're serving people who want it. So it's a very difficult thing to to kind of balance. Um, I, it's already happening. If you go to Bangkok now, if you were there two years ago, and you go to Bangkok now, Sukhumvit is now clear. There is hmm. no vendors on the street on Sukhumvit at all, and it used to be from basically from Soy One all the way up to Soy Twenty Four, solid vendors day and night. Daytime, it was not just food vendors, but like you know, all the vendors are out, and it's weird. It's really weird. They've been pushed onto the side soys and into like doorways and down little side streets and stuff like that. Um, and it's it's I think it's a uh, at the end of the day, if if Bangkok turned into Singapore, it'd be a terrible shame. I don't think the Thai people will allow that to happen. I don't think that that's going to happen. I think that it'll happen in central business areas and it'll happen in the heavily touristed areas, except for places where they kind of form food courts and stuff like that. But I don't think it'll go away entirely. But Singapore still has a good reputation for its food. It like doesn't an have any food. It's got, great, its food. it's got a great, great reputation for food, but it's all in, court, in food halls those, yeah, I've and been to in those. restaurants. And I think there, there, there are those in Bangkok who wish that that was how it was. Right. Um, and, you know, at Singapore. Honestly, the food in Singapore, I think, has gotten better recently, like in the last 10 years. I think that really that yeah. whole the food court, the food hall thing has made the vendors, it's gotten competition. So you've got, you got to be good or else you're not going to get any yes. business. Yes, I've had amazing on. street food in Singapore, yeah. like top-notch, super clean, yeah. delicious. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I mean, I, 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 I miss that vibe walking around in certain areas, but in other, other cases, it's kind of, you know, what are you going to do? Right. Yeah. Thank you. Do you think the U.S. has gotten better about representation of regional cuisines? Like, I've gone to um, an Isan restaurant in both Houston and New York and enjoyed that a lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, as far as Thai food goes, absolutely. Over the last 10, you know, especially the last five years, there's been a big explosion. And I think that um, a certain amount of it has to do with the fact that uh, younger Thai folks who either have grown up here or uh, who have come here as students, who are more hip and in tune with what people are willing to eat, uh, have finally kind of gone, you know what, we can do this. Uh, one of the things that, that you would you find the old guard Thai restaurant owners, they just, there was a cultural thing, 
uh, that's changing where they, they just culturally couldn't believe that you as a farang can eat what they eat. Is they look at you and go, no way, you, 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 can't, you can't eat spice and you can't eat funky and there's no way. Um, but, but that's not really true, I think for a couple of reasons. Number one, uh, we as a, as a country, as a population, uh, have gotten a lot more adventurous. And number two, we've gotten a lot less white. <laughs> and there's, there's people out there you know, who, whose parents are from another country or they've grown up in a, in a, in a home where the food wasn't bologna sandwiches. And you know, they go to school and they go to college and they're with other folks from African culture or Southeast Asian culture, South Asian culture, Middle Eastern culture, all mixing together. And I think there's just a bigger, there's a broader acceptance because the people who are spending money on food now are, are not lily white anymore. So I think that has a lot to do with it as well. But yeah, like as far as Thai food goes, Virtually every city you go to now, there's something popping up that is kind of like regional. You go to Atlanta, there's uh, Talat, and a guy's calling it Talat Market. <laughs> it means market, market. <laughs> oh. uh, um, and there's, there's uh, you know, in, in New York especially, when we opened Pock Pock in New York uh, five plus years ago, uh, there was us, and there were a few, you know, there were the old school, like Ayada, Super Pie, that kind of thing. And since we've opened, there's now you know probably eight or ten different restaurants that are specializing in Isan or northern food or you know really high quality central Thai food. So it's definitely a trend. Um, for those who maybe aren't familiar with the different varieties of Thai food, what would you say characterizes like each foods, each of the regional food cuisines? Okay, so there's you know there's four basic regions in Thailand: um, the north. Northeast, center, and south. Uh, starting in the north, this is a lot of the food that we do at, at Pak Pak is from the north. Uh, the staple rice there is sticky rice, and the food tends to be, because it's landlocked, mountainous rivers, um, tends to be in jungle, it tends to be uh, herbaceous, uh, salty, spicy, but not super spicy. Um, little elements of sour that come from leaves and, and other kind of fruits aside from lemons and limes and stuff like that. Uh, and bitter is a, is a flavor that features pretty heavily in northern Thai food. Uh, Isan, which is the arid northeast part of, of Thailand where the folks are mostly Lao and Khmer. The food there tends to be very simple. Uh, they, they don't have a lot of resources, so a lot of fermentation there. A lot of relatively spicy things, um, so hot and 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 kind of uh, salty tends to be the predominant flavors. Sour in Isan, uh, sticky rice is a staple. Um, they eat a lot of things. That, that, that's a place where a lot of things like uh, uh, ant eggs, mm. uh, insects. A lot of things, like, it's, it's a, like I said, it's a very arid region and the, the resources, there aren't a lot of resources, so people get food where they can. And over the years, over the, this, you know, centuries, they've kind of developed a taste for, for things that are, that are probably not prime meats. What do ant eggs taste like? Ant eggs are actually really good. They're red, red ant, ant eggs, they're, little, they're white and they're about that big, they kind of pop in your mouth and they're, 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 they're good. They're like caviar really kind of? Uh, they're not fishy. Okay. Not fishing. Anyway, continue. Um, then center Th central Thailand, where the Thai people are, you know, for the last I don't know, five six hundred years, that's been where the seat of power is. Uh, that's where the royal palace is. That's where the the royal cuisine has really blossomed. Uh, it's also the bread basket of the country. It's where most of the produce and uh, rice and um, fruit are grown. And so the food there tends to be kind of richer, more sophisticated. There's access to, to the coconut uh, groves from the south um, and uh, quite a sophisticated cuisine there. So it tends to be hot, sour, salty, and sweet with sweetness kind of being a little more prominent there than most other places in the country. Um, and then the south, which is peninsular Thailand below uh, Bangkok, um, where the further south you go, the more Malaysian folks get down there. Um, 
you know, sea on both sides. So lots of um, seafood, lots of fish, lots of shellfish, uh, coconut groves. So a lot of really rich coconut curries down there and the spiciest food in the country. Really the hottest stuff. They've, they've really developed a, a taste for ultra hot food down there. A lot of influence from Malaysia, Indian flavors there. Uh, so I think that's, that's a broad, that's a very general overview of what you might find. Well, I have a more general question about Thai food and the way you mentioned like Thai as a country and like if you think of like the food as the embodiment of the culture, the way people eat it indicates like what do you think makes like Thai food's impact on culture and vice versa? Like how would you define what is unique about Thai food and the culture? Well, I think I think these days uh, probably food is the, the most common way that Thai culture is expressed outside of Thailand. Like if most people who go to Thailand have had some experience with Thai food. It's kind of the, it's the outreach, the cultural outreach. It's also, you gotta understand that Thailand is a foodie culture. They're not foodies, but they just like, food is such a huge part of the, of the, uh, the culture there. Um, there. It's very rare to, to go to any kind of occasion or, or uh, fun happening where food isn't involved. It's involved in every single thing. There's foods that you eat uh, for special occasions. There's foods, you go to, it's not uncommon to go to the beach and see people in the, in the water eating <laughs> while they're swimming. Um, it's, there's this element of fun, sanuk they call sanuk, that, that Thai people in, in any occasion want to have this, this feeling of sanuk. And having food and, and uh, having discourse, like being with your family, right? So I, I would say as an outsider observing Thai culture, I'd say that probably family is the, the most important thing, then the king, then the, then the royal family, or, or then Buddhism, then the king, and then food after that, in that order. <laughs> so uh, it, it's hugely important, and it, it is kind of part of the culture ide cultural identity of Thai folks outside of Thailand. So um, you've been going to Thailand for about 30 years, right? Mm. And not wanting to fetishize the past or, or pretend that change isn't a good thing, is there anything that you've seen sort of vanish over that period that you regret seeing go? Um, I mean, you, you, there is a, uh, from a culinary standpoint, I think that there has been a broad acceptance of, of uh, processed food uh, that, that's unfortunate to me because it's, it's having an impact on the health of the people of the country. Um, youth culture is kind of focused on things that are kind of fast food. If you, if you watch TV there, there's lots of ads for KFC and Pizza Hut and uh, Gayan Hadao and stuff like that, where people are eating uh, CP, eating a lot of processed foods these days. Palate is swung towards uh, the sweet side of things and the fatty side of things. But it's, you know, if you think about it, it's kind of natural. It's a natural thing. When, when there's more disposable income, the people who have that disposable income want things that, that were out of reach before, like the richer foods, the eating more meat than, than vegetables, that kind of thing. It's, it's inevitable. Um, but you can still, like I said before, you can still find the, the old ways of cooking. It's just it's disappearing like anywhere else in the, in the world. Young folks aren't as interested in hanging out at the, at the family kitchen and learning at the foot of their, of their dad and then taking the business over. And the parents don't want them to. The parents want them to go off to university and become a doctor or a lawyer or, or whatever, you know, because it's a better life. So it's just like anywhere else in the world, I think, changing. Please tell me if this is a silly question, but one of the things that I noticed when I visited Bangkok is how a lot of the street cooking was done with woks, mm -hmm. and it was very hot. And so I'm, well, the woks are cooked at a hot temperature. Sure. Um, I'm curious if you have any tips for people that live in an apartment or with the ventilation that an apartment offers or the types of stoves that apartments often uh -huh. have for how I to, do, how I do. Dealing with it, how avoid with avoid the dishes that you need okay. a very hot wok to cook. <laughs> <laughs> so pak bung fai dang, for instance, you probably don't want to do that in your apartment, or pat uh, si yu, or something like that. That really to get the, the really great taste, you need that really really smoking hot. If you have a balcony, 
just go against your condo associations thing. Got to get out there and do it anyway. Um, but yeah, I mean, look, anything that's cooked in a wok is, is, if you look closely enough at it, it's probably got, if you need a wok to make it, it's a Chinese-influenced dish. And a lot of the dishes that, that are kind of are very, very Thai or very northern, the, the, the original cooking techniques would have been boiling, grilling, uh, steaming, that kind, of, that kind of cooking. So a lot like curries, don't, you don't need a, a wok to make a curry. You don't need a wok to make a yam or a salad. You don't need a wok to make grilled foods. Uh, you can get away with, with just using kind of a, a nice aluminum pan that's shaped like a wok for, for a lot of stuff, or just a regular pot. So that, that'd be my answer. Wait till you go home to your parents' house and burn up their place. <laughs> Um, so I have some in-laws that are stahirais farmers in a village outside of Chiang Rai. Mm. And whenever I eat with them, the food is delicious, but so spicy that I'm literally sobbing uh -huh. by the second bite. Um, so I was wondering, what is your experience with adjusting or not adjusting dishes to s better suit American palates? And how does that relate to your refusal to use terms like authenticity and tradition? Okay, so um, so you're... you're I, I, there's one of two things that I'm going to guess about about your your situation. Number one is that your that your family really loves spicy food, and number two, maybe you don't have a strong tolerance for spicy food. Um, I get maybe the former. Maybe the former, yeah. yeah. So uh, you know, heat is a relative term, and and the to me in the north, the vast majority of people up there don't eat things super spicy. Um, a lot of the dishes that you have, and and. You know, you, you could argue, well, you're a white guy, so when they see you coming, they tone it down for you. But the problem, the, the thing is about that is that, that there's ways around that. You go to the restaurant that's, that where the food is pre-made, and you just order what everybody else is having. And you can get a really a good sense of what it is that they're, that they're making there. You can, and the other thing to remember about food in Thailand and going and eating there is that if the food isn't pre-made, Thai people have a lot of say in how their food turns out. They can tell the vendor, make it spicy, and tell them exactly how spicy to make it, or not spicy. Or they avoid the place that's spicy, or they avoid the place that's not spicy. Whereas here, uh, culturally, we expect the food to arrive at the table exactly the way that we expect it to arrive there. And a lot of times, unless we have familiarity with the food, we lack the vocabulary to, to say how we like it. So this whole thing with five stars, that has no meaning. Right? That's, a, that's literally a no meaning thing. Uh, all that means is that there's more chili powder goes in. And there's no standard across. If you ask 10 restaurateurs, what does five star mean? They're going to have a different answer for what they do to make it five star chili hot. Right? So how do, we, how, do, how do I determine the spice level of the food that we serve? I don't make any kind of, um, I, I don't tone it down, per se. But I might not make a dish at the restaurant that's just ballistically spicy, or I won't have all the dishes on the menu be spicy. I'll have a dish that's appropriate to be really, really spicy. And that's just the way it is, right? <laughs> like our, our uh, mukhamwan, our boar collar. That's spicy as fuck, and that's the way it is. And I'm sorry, if you don't like it, you shouldn't have the dish. <laughs> that's it, you know? Uh, just eat lots of sticky rice with it. Um, so, you know, it, but, but there's other things like, say, gang hung lei, right? The northern Thai Burmese uh, pork uh, belly curry. That's not a spicy dish. It just isn't. It's, it is not a spicy dish. So when it arrives at the table and it's not spicy and people are like, I need this to be spicy, it's like, well, sure. Here, have some chili powder. I don't really know what to give you to make it spicy because that's not a dish that's spicy. Uh, kasoi, same story. You get kasoi, and that's a mild dish. It's not spicy. It really isn't. Uh, you have to add chili paste to it to make it spicy. Um, Kukling, like the southern Thai minced uh, meat uh, curry that has lots and lots of that, that's ballistically hot. And I don't, it wouldn't taste right unless it was ballistically hot. So I, that's, a, that's a lot of words to kind of not give you an answer. <laughs> <laughs> well done. Um, I think we are finished. We're out of time. So thanks, everyone, for coming. Thank you so much for being yeah, here. Yeah, yeah. Pleasure. Thank you, guys. I think we got some books to give away too.